Here's another fascinating talk with the tenacious Scott Douglas Jacobson. And it is, of course, fascinating because I'm in it. <laughs> okay, Shoshanim, let's delve right in, see what Scott has in store for me. Question number one. When did the first human-machine interactions truly begin in modern history, insofar as we take technology now? Dr. Sambaknin's answer, <laughs> when a man or a woman picked up a stone and threw it at a scavenger. Jacobson, how have technologies influenced the psychosocial makeup of human beings? Vaknin, technology fostered the delusion that every problem has a solution, and the hubris that attends upon proving this contention somewhat true. We have learned to internalize technologies and render them our extensions. And this drives us deeper into fantastic paracosms, replete with populations of internal objects that represent cohorts of external devices and systems. We became dependent on technology, and this dependency emerged as our default mode, leading us to prefer machines to other humans. Dazzled Jacobson. These technologies, especially contemporary ones, come out of smart people working hard. How are they, in a way, extensions of ourselves based on those smart people's understanding of some principle and then applying this to ergonomic design? Ponderous Vaknin. These so-called smart people are not representative of humanity, not even remotely. They are self a self-selecting sample, a self-selecting sample of schizoid, mostly white, mostly men. I am not sure why you limited your question to the least important and most neglected aspect of technology, ergonomic design, dictated by the very structure and functioning of the human body. There are other, much more crucial aspects of technology that reflect the specific mental health pathologies and idiosyncrasies and eccentricities of engineers, coders, and entrepreneurs, rather than any aspect or dimension of being human. Jacobson, how are military applications showing this to be the case with drones and the like? Also, the eventual reductio ad absurdum of long-term war with all these technology innovations around, autonomous war robots and so on, seems increasingly apparent when, in some hypothetical future, it would be simply machines fighting machines for some geographic or resource squabble of some leaders. Vaknin. War is increasingly more democratized. Terrorism and asymmetrical warfare, anyone? War is also more remote controlled. But the main aim of war is still to kill people, combatants and civilians alike. Machines will never merely fight only other contraptions. War will never be reduced to a mechanized version of chess. Men, women and children will always die in battle as conflict becomes ever more total. The repossession of resources requires the unmitigated annihilation of their erstwhile owners. Jacobson are autocratic, theocratic, or democratic societies? Do, are, do they utilize the technologies interfacing with human beings more wisely? And which ones? Vaknin. Wisdom is in the, in the eye of the beholder. There is no difference in the efficacy of deploying technologies between various societal organizational forms. All governments, all collectives, autocratic, democratic, theocratic, even oclocratic and anarchic, all leverage technology in order to secure and protect the regime and in order to buttress the narratives that motivate people to fight, work, consume and mate. Jacobson. I interviewed another smart guy. Thank you, Scott. I interviewed another smart guy, Dr. Evangelos Katsiulis. Years ago, he at the time, maybe now too, 
believed that no limit existed to the interaction between machines and humans. When will human mechanics be understood sufficiently to when, as with the ship of Theseus, human beings can function as human beings with 10%, 25%, 75% non-biological machine parts comprising their localized subjectivity and locomotion? Vaknin. This will happen much sooner than we think. But there will always be a resistance, a substantial portion of the population, who will remain averse to cyborg integration. And as the Luddites of yesteryear, these people will seek to forbid such chimeras and destroy them. In some rudimentary ways, we are already integrated with machines. Can you imagine your life without your devices? Jacobson, how are interactions with technologies more intimately blaring the sense of self? That's a very good question. Human brains are ill-equipped to tell the difference between reality and mimicry, simulation and fantasy. Technologies are the reifications of the latter at the expense of the former. One of the crucial aspects of the putative self or ego is reality testing. As the boundaries blur, so will ourselves. We are likely to acquire a hive mind, melded with all the technologies that surround us, seamlessly slipping in and out of dream states and metaverses. The self will become the functional equivalent of our attire, our clothing, changeable, disposable, and replaceable. As it is, I am an opponent of the counterfactual idea of the existence of some kernel, immutable core identity, self or ego. Jacobson, how are, how are the plurality of software and hardware available, vastly outstripping the capacity for ordinary people to use them all, let alone understand them? Most seem drawn merely to video games, television, cell phones and some social media platforms. That's about it. And there's so much, so much more around now. Vaknin, there have always been technologies for the masses as well as for niche users. Where we broke off with the past is in multitasking, the simultaneous suboptimal use of multiple devices. Jacobson, what is the ultimate point of human machine interfaces? We birthed electronic machines and information processing. What will be birthed from this union of biological mechanisms and alloyed assistants, playthings? Vaknin. As they get more integrated by the day, the point is to empower, enhance and expand both symbiotic partners, humans and machines alike. It is a virtuous cycle which will lead to functional specialization with both parties focused on what they do best. Still, if humans fail to bake Asimov-like rules into their automata, the potential for conflict is there as artificial intelligence becomes more sentient and intelligent and prone to passing the Turing test with flying colors. In short, indistinguishable from us except with regards to its considerably more potent processing prowess. Popular culture reflected this uncanny valley, the growing unease with android robots, first postulated by Masahiro Mori, the Japanese roboticist, in 1970. And we all remember Blade Runner, the masterpiece film movie in 1982. There's another movie, iRobot iRobot is a more muddled affair. It relies on shoddy pseudoscience and a general sense of unease that artificial, non-carbon-based, intelligent life forms seem to provoke in us. But the movie goes no deeper than a comic book treatment of the important themes that it broaches. iRobot is just another and relatively inferior entry in a long line of far better movies. I mentioned Blade Runner, but also artificial intelligence. Sigmund Freud said that we have an uncanny reaction to the inanimate, 
This is probably because we know that pretensions and layers of philosophizing aside, we are nothing but recursive, self-aware, introspective, conscious machines. Special machines, no doubt, but machines all the same. Consider the James Bond movie. They, con the movies, the whole franchise, they constitute a decades-spanning gallery of human paranoia. Villains change, communists, neo-Nazis, media moguls, but one kind of villain is a fixture in this psychodrama, in this parade of human phobias, the machine. James Bond always finds himself confronted with hideous, vicious, malicious machines and automata. It was precisely to counter this wave of unease, even terror, irrational but all pervasive, that Isaac Asimov, the late sci-fi writer and scientist, invented the three laws of robotics. Number one, a robot may not injure a human being or through inaction allow, allow a human being to come to harm. Number two, a robot must obey the orders given it by human beings except where such orders would conflict with the first law. And law number three, a robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or the second laws. Many have noticed the lack of consistency and therefore the inapplicability of these laws when they are considered together. First, they are not derived from any coherent worldview or background. To be properly implemented and to avoid their interpretation in a potentially dangerous manner, the robots in which they are embedded must be equipped with reasonably comprehensive models of the physical universe, of human society and of themselves. Without such context, these laws soon lead to intractable paradoxes, experienced as a nervous breakdown by one of Asimov's robots. Conflicts are ruinous in automata based on recursive functions, on enduring machines. All robots are such machines, so we should avoid conflicts. Gödel pointed at one such self-destructive paradox in the Principia Mathematica, ostensibly a comprehensive and self-consistent logical system. It was enough to discredit the whole magnificent edifice constructed by Russell and Whitehead over a decade. Some argue against this. They say that robots need not be automata in the classical church-turing sense, that they could act according to heuristic, probabilistic rules of decision-making, that that there are many other types of functions, non-recursive, that can be incorporated in a robot. True, all this is true. But then how can one guarantee that the robot's behavior is fully predictable? How can one be certain that robots will fully and always implement the three laws? Only recursive systems are predictable in principle, though at times their complexity makes it impossible. This article deals with some common sense basic problems raised by the laws. And so, an immediate question springs to mind. How will a robot identify a human being? Surely in a future of perfect androids, constructed of organic materials, no superficial outer scanning will suffice. And that's a major problem. Um, Structure and composition will not be sufficient differentiating factors. There are two ways to settle this very practical issue. One is to endow the robot with the ability to conduct a converse Turing test, to separate humans from other life forms. The other is to somehow barcode all the robots by implanting some remotely readable signaling device inside them, such as RFID, radio frequency ID chip both present additional difficulties. The second solution, for example, will prevent the robot from positively identifying humans. He will be able to, he will be able to identify with any certainty robots and only robots or humans with such implants. This is ignoring, for discussion's sake, defects in manufacturing or loss of the implanted identification tags. And what if a robot were to get rid of its tag? Will this also be classified as a defect in manufacturing? In any case, robots will be forced to make a binary choice. 
they will be compelled to classify one type of physical entities as robots and all the others as non-robots. Will non-robots include monkeys and parrots? Yes, unless a manufacturer has equipped the robots with digital or optical or molecular representations of the human figure, masculine and feminine, in varying positions, standing, sitting, lying down, or unless all humans are somehow tagged as well from birth. These are cumbersome and repulsive solutions and not very effective ones. No dictionary of human forms and positions is likely to be complete. There will always be the odd physical posture which the robot would find impossible to match to its library or database. A human disc thrower or a swimmer may easily be classified as non-human by a robot and so might amputated invalids. What about administering a converse Turing test? This is even more seriously flawed. It is possible to design a test which robots will apply to distinguish artificial life forms from human beings, but it will have to be non-intrusive and not involve overt and prolonged communication. The alternative is a protracted teletype session with the human concealed behind a curtain after which the robot will issue its verdict. The respondent is a human or a robot. This is, of course, unthinkable and undoable. Moreover, the application of such a test will humanize the robot in many important respects. Humans identify other humans because they are human too. This is called empathy. A robot will have to be somewhat human to recognize another human being. It takes one to know one, the saying rightly goes. Let us assume that by some miraculous way the problem is overcome and robots unfailingly identify humans. The next question pertains to the notion of injury. We are still stuck in the first law. Is injury limited only to physical injury, the elimination of the physical continuity of human tissues or of the normal functioning of the human body? Should injury in the first law encompass the no less serious mental, psychological, verbal and social injuries? After all, these injuries are known to have physical side effects, which are at times no less severe than direct physical injuries. Is an insult an injury? What about social rejection? What about being grossly, grossly impolite or psychologically abusive or offending religious sensitivities, being politically incorrect? Are these injuries? The bulk of human and therefore inhuman actions actually do offend one human being or another. They have the potential to do so or seem to be doing so. Consider, for example, surgery, or driving a car, or investing money in the stock exchange. These innocuous acts may end in a coma, in an accident, or in ruinous financial losses, respectively. Should a robot refuse to obey human instructions, which may result in injury to the instruction givers? Consider a mountain climber. Should a robot refuse to hand him his equipment, Lest he, fall, lest he falls off a cliff in an unsuccessful bid to reach the peak? Should a robot refuse to obey human commands pertaining to the crossing of busy roads or driving dangerous sports cars or race cars? Which level of risk, in other words, should trigger robotic refusal and even prophylactic intervention? This brings to mind Hull in uh, Odyssey 2001. At which stage of the interactive men-machine collaboration should this first law in robots be activated? Should a robot refuse to fetch a ladder or a rope to someone who intends to commit suicide by hanging himself? And that's an easy one. Should the robot ignore an instruction to push his master off the cliff, definitely, to help him climb the cliff? less assuredly so, to drive him to the cliff, maybe so, to help him get into his car in order to drive him to the cliff, etc., etc. Where do we draw the line? Where do the responsibility and obeisance bucks, where do they stop? And so it's a conundrum. Whatever the answer, one thing is clear. 
such a robot must be equipped with more than rudimentary sense of judgment. With the ability to appraise and analyze complex situations, to predict the future and to base its decisions on very fuzzy algorithms. No programmer can foresee all possible circumstances. And to me, such a robot sounds much more dangerous and humanoid than any recursive automaton, which does not include the famous three laws. Moreover, what exactly constitutes inaction? How can we set apart inaction from failed action, or worse, from an action which failed by design, intentionally, even malevolently. If a human is in danger and the robot tries to save the human and fails, how could we determine to what extent the robot exerted itself and did everything it could? How much of the responsibility of a robot's inaction or partial action or failed action should be imputed to the manufacturer of the robot, and how much to the robot itself? When a robot decides finally to ignore its own programming, how are we to gain information regarding this momentous event? Outside appearances can hardly be expected to help us distinguish a rebellious robot from a lackadaisical one. The situation gets much more complicated when we consider states of conflict. Imagine that a robot is obliged to harm one human in order to prevent him from hurting another. The laws are absolutely inadequate in this case. The robot should either establish an empirical hierarchy of injuries, a triage of kinds, or an empirical hierarchy of humans. Should we as humans rely on robots or on the manufacturers of robots, however wise, moral, and compassionate, to make these selections for us? Should we abide by their judgment uh, concerning which injury is the most serious? and warrants an intervention, which person is worth saving or interfering on behalf of? A summary of the, of, of the Asimov laws would give us the following truth table. A robot must obey human commands except if, one, obeying them is likely to cause injury to a human, or, two, obeying them will let a human be injured. A robot must protect its own existence with three exceptions. One, that such self-protection is injurious to a human, two, that such self-protection entails inaction in the face of potential injury to a human, three, that such self-protection results in robot insubordination, failing to obey human instructions. And so trying to create a truth table based on these conditions is the best way to demonstrate the problematic nature of Asimov's idealized yet highly impractical world. <laughs> Here is an exercise. Imagine a situation. Consider the example below, or anything you, you may wish to make up. But imagine a situation, and then create a truth table based on the above five conditions. In such a truth table, T would stand for compliance, and F for non-compliance. Take the following example. A radioactivity monitoring robot malfunctions. If it self-destructs, its human operator might be injured. If it does not, its malfunction will equally seriously injure a patient dependent on his performance. One of the possible solutions, of course, is to introduce gradations, a probability calculus, utility calculus, uh, even a moral calculus. As they are phrased by Asimov, the rules and conditions are of a threshold, yes or no, take it or leave it nature. They represent splitting. But if robots were to be in a kind of dichotomous thinking, but if robots were to be instructed to maximize overall utility, many borderline cases would be resolved. Still, even the introduction of heuristics, probability, and utility does not help us resolve the dilemma in the example above. Life is about inventing new rules on the fly as we go and as we encounter new challenges in a kaleidoscopically metamorphosizing world. Robots with rigid instruction sets are ill-suited to cope with that. So at the risk of going abstruse, two comments to round up this discussion. First, regarding Gödel's theorems, which I've mentioned before. 
The work of an important, though eccentric, Czech-Austrian mathematical logician, Kurt Gödel, between 1906-1978, dealt with the completeness and consistency of logical systems. A passing acquaintance with his two theorems would have saved the architect a lot of time. Gödel's first incompleteness theorem states that Every consistent axiomatic logical system sufficient to express arithmetic contains true but unprovable, non-decidable sentences. In certain cases, when the system is omega consistent, both said sentences and their negation are unprovable. The system is consistent and true, but not complete, because not all its sentences can be decided as true or false by, by either being proved or by being refuted. The second incompleteness theorem is even more earth-shattering. It says that no consistent formal logical system can prove its own consistency. The system may be incomplete and may be complete, but then we are unable to show, using its axioms and inference laws, that it is consistent. So, a system can be complete, but we would never know if it's consistent. It might as well be inconsistent. A computational system can be either complete um, and inconsistent or consistent and incomplete. By trying to construct a system both complete and consistent, a robotics engineer would run afoul of Gödel's theorems. And the second comment is about Turing machines. In 1936, an American, Alonzo Church, and a Briton, Alan M. Turing, Publish independently, as is often the case in science, the basics of a new branch of mathematics and logic, computability or recursive functions, later to be developed into automata theory. The authors confined themselves to dealing with computations which involved effective or mechanical methods for finding results, which could also be expressed as solutions, values, to formulae. These methods were so called because they could in principle be performed by simple machines, or human computers or human calculators, to use Turing's unfortunate phrases. The emphasis was on finiteness, being finite, a finite number of instructions, a finite number of symbols in each instruction, a finite number of steps to the result, etc., etc. This is why these methods were usable by humans without the aid of an apparatus, with the exception of pencil and paper as memory aids. Moreover, no insight or ingenuity were allowed to interfere or to be part of the solution-seeking process. What Church and Turing did was to construct a set of all the functions whose values could be obtained by applying effective or mechanical calculation methods. Turing went, went further down Church's road and designed the Turing machine, a machine which can calculate the values of all the functions whose values can be found using effective or mechanical methods. And thus, the program running the Turing machine was really an effective or mechanical method. For the initiated readers, Church solved the decision problem for propositional calculus, and Turing proved that there is no solution to the decision problem relating to the predicate calculus. Put more simply, it is possible to prove the truth value or the theorem status of an expression in the propositional calculus, but not in the predicate calculus. Later it was shown that many functions, even in number theory itself, were not recursive, meaning that they could not be solved by a Turing machine. No one succeeded to prove that a function must be recursive in order to be effectively calculable. This is, as Post noted, a working hypothesis supported by overwhelming evidence. We don't know of any effectively calculable function which is not recursive. By designing new Turing machines from existing ones, we can obtain new effectively calculable functions from existing ones. And Turing machine computability stars in every attempt to understand effective calculability. All these attempts are reducible or equivalent to Turing machine computable, computable functions. The Turing machine itself, though abstract, has many real-world features. It is a blueprint for a computing device, with one ideal exception, its unbounded memory. The tape is infinite. Despite its hardware appearance, there's a read, write head, 
which scans a two-dimensional tape inscribed with ones and zeros. So this, despite this hardware emphasis, it really is a software application in today's terminology. It carries out instructions, reads, writes, counts, and so on. It is an automaton designed to implement an effective mechanical method of solving functions, determining the truth value of propositions. If the transition from input to output is deterministic, we have a classical automaton. If it is determined by a table of probabilities, we have a prob probabilistic automaton. With time and hype, the limitations of Turing machines were long forgotten. No one can say that the mind is a Turing machine because no one can prove that it is, it is engaged in solving only recursive functions. We can say that Turing machines can do whatever digital computers are doing, but not the digital computers are Turing machines by definition. Maybe they are, maybe they're not. We do not know enough about them and about their future. Moreover, the demand that recursive functions be computable by an unaided human seems to restrict possible equivalence. Inasmuch as computers emulate human computation, and Turing did believe so when he helped construct the ACE, at the time the fastest computer in the world. So to that extent, they are Turing machines. Functions whose values are calculated by aided humans with the contribution of a computer are still recursive. It is when humans are aided by other kinds of instruments that we have a problem. If we use measuring devices to determine the values of a function, it does not seem to conform to the definition of a recursive, recursive function. So we can generalize and say that functions whose values are calculated by an aided human could be recursive, depending on the apparatus used and on the lack of ingenuity or insight um, a weak, non-rigorous requirement, which cannot be formalized. So, if we have a situation where an aided human is calculating something, using a specific type of apparatus, and there's a lack of ingenuity or insight, even though this is a, non a weak, non-rigorous requirement, which cannot be formalized, the recursivity of the functions used is in doubt. These were two general comments to elevate the conversation to the more professional level. Thank you for listening. And of course, substitute the word narcissist wherever I say robot, and you would still be largely right.